For context, in the middle of last year, my partner, 28-year-old female, and I, 23-year-old male, decided to try polyamory. We had basically fallen into a long-term relationship from the get-go, with her moving in a couple of weeks into the relationship, which meant that we didn't really have a traditional dating experience, so that was something I've been feeling like I've missed out on for the last year or so. We've been together just over three years now, and since my partner approached me about going poly, I thought it could be a great opportunity to get that experience. Not long after we went poly, through a series of events we ended up living separately. This made it easy for us to see other people, and made our time together that bit more special too, so it was win-win. I was excited to be able to date without having to worry about needing the house to myself, so no one felt uncomfortable about being around the other's date. And since I'd been unsuccessful finding a date until we'd started living apart, I was ready to give it a proper go. Now, skip to today, I've been using an alternative dating app that's poly-friendly, and by proxy, very kink-friendly too, and I finally had a match. This girl seemed cute, my age, local, and was fine with the fact that I had a partner, so it was all systems go. We start chatting in the app, and she requests to move to a pretty popular messaging service, to which I thought, no big deal, it'll be nice to have another app to keep our relationship chats in, so I set up an account. The app was very similar to WhatsApp, and thus required a phone number to use. This is important later. We start talking there, and things get a little spicy, and although I'm new to that kind of thing, I know not to include my face in any pics that are compromising yada yada, so I'm being pretty safe with it. She sends some pictures, I send some pictures. Things go well, and we decide to meet for some cocktails, and see where it goes from there, and she seems very forward in where she would like it to go. I'm nervous and excited. This would be my first date outside of my main relationship, and I had been looking forward to something like this for a while. We agree a time and place, which I suggest, and I spend some time after work getting myself looking nice, little beard trim, put nice smelling stuff on my neck, etc., and make my way to the restaurant early to get a drink in me to help me calm down a little. On the way, I get a message from my date, saying her roommate is ill and needs some looking after, so she won't be able to make it in until later. This does set some alarm bells ringing, but I say, don't worry about it. If your roomie needs help, then that takes priority, and decide to get a bite to eat while I wait and suss out the situation. I decide, admittedly a bit late, to ask her to send a pic of her holding a spoon. She asks what for, so I say it's for verification that she actually exists, you know how it is. She says, be right back, and proceeds to be offline for the next 45 minutes, during which time I come to the conclusion that I have been bamboozled, tricked, and shammed into hoping I had an actual date tonight. I go home after finishing my halloumi sticks. I let my partner and a couple of friends know the situation, and decide to play some video games to cap off what was a nice evening of dating myself, when I get the expected message, quote, Now I'll start posting to your family friends on Facebook and Instagram. You can call it bluffing, and I'll ruin your life immediately. You fail to reply me, I'll take it as a yes to post, and I'll start posting as soon as possible. Don't bother to delete your social media accounts, as I have the names and screenshots of everyone already." End quote. Attached was a crap Photoshop job of my pics, dating profile, Facebook profile, which was found by searching my phone number. Make that stuff private, people all of which I was being threatened to have sent to my also non-private friends list unless I transferred 500 pounds. All my close friends know I'm poly and am able to date. My parents don't know, but they wouldn't care all too much. I have no work colleagues on there, so that's not an issue, but I still wouldn't appreciate a pic of my little guy floating around the DMs of everyone I know. If they want to see it, they should just ask, you know? So, I'm letting this person know that I'm actually a terrible mark. Literally would not affect me if this got out, aside from mild embarrassment. As I'm doing so, I get a message from my partner saying this scam lord has tried messaging them, which I confirmed since the scanner sent a screenshot of said message, but from their end. 
However, they sent the message from their own Facebook profile. I proceed to do a deep dive into this person's profile. Turns out Kate, from the dating app, is actually some 13-year-old kid, originally from Nigeria, but in school in the UK, and also has a very public profile which includes their friends list. I proceed to crap myself laughing at the fact that I got catfished by a random Nigerian kid. I respect the hustle though. I immediately stop being worried about the pics spreading around, since the wannabe scam master has given up messaging me and proceeded to do some detective work to find his relatives. I have since sent screenshots of this little reprobate's activities to his very religious mother, aunt, father, and pastor, explaining that he's been trying this on adult dating apps. Curious to see how they'll respond to their Christian kid chatting with horny adult men on the internet, but I'm sure he's in for a good time. Just gotta wait for the messages to be read. Lesson learned. Ask for verification pics immediately. Don't swap to another app where any details may be exposed. Keep all your stuff on private to avoid blackmail. And don't pay $6.95 for below average halloumi sticks. I catfished one of my high school teachers because he was bullying me. For some background, I'm a guy and he knew my dad because my dad, who was a lawyer, had represented his ex-wife several years before in a super bitter divorce. For some reason, he took that frustration out on me. He would verbally abuse me in front of the class. If I raised my hand to answer a question, he would roll his eyes before calling on me and loudly say to the class, Listen to what he says. That way, you will know what the wrong answers are. He would criticize my work, make comments about how I'll never amount to much because obviously I have a learning disability. I don't. He was just being a prick. I would often get marked down for penmanship, but after asking some classmates, apparently I was the only one being graded on that. I know history wasn't my best subject, but the way I was being treated was totally uncalled for. I began having anxiety going to class. I would dread it all day. My friends would even mention casually, yeah, Mr. Smith really doesn't like you. What did you do to him? My dad was pissed that he was obviously being biased towards me for something I had nothing to do with. Dad made noise and tried to get me moved into another class, but the district and school were over capacity as it was. I couldn't move classes without displacing another student, and the school didn't think that would be fair to the other student. But it's fair to me to let this keep going on, because you can't move me. What the hell? Now, my dad never discussed details of his cases, but I had overheard him angrily telling my mum, after our meeting with the principal, that he doesn't like that I'm in that pedo's class. An idea was planted in my head, and it started to grow. I devised a plan. I gathered social media pics of a girl and made some profiles on Kik and WhatsApp using Google voice number for our city. I changed her name for obvious reasons. I picked her because she went to a different school across town. I had met her at a couple of parties and she had a lot of mirror selfies posted on her Facebook and Insta and I needed it to feel authentic to him. I only needed 8 to 10 selfies and another reason I chose her was she was blonde with a slender body type. I was able to find many girls on Reddit who didn't show their face and fit that loose description. I used two to three gone wild pics from one user's account when he pushed me for nudes. I told him that she didn't have any social media because she was quote, into older guys and they didn't want anyone to know, so I don't have social media to make them more comfortable. In hindsight, I feel like he should have been suspicious of a 17-year-old girl without social media, so maybe it's a little on him too. I got his cell from a classmate who had it because he was one of the many assistant coaches for our football team. Most of the team had it because they had all exchanged phone numbers at a retreat the team went on the prior summer. I texted him out of the blue, saying I saw him at a football game our schools had played earlier in the year and I thought he was cute. He felt out the situation first, 
but it was obvious after I sent the first selfie of hers that he was hooked. I would only give him a selfie if he really begged for it, and the more he begged, the more flirty I would act. We never sexted, I barely knew at that age what to say anyway. I would describe the vibe I went with as awkwardly forward. Also, I never specifically asked for pics. He arrived at that juncture on his own. It caught me off guard when it happened. I texted him using the Google voice number for a while, then told him my mum read my texts, but didn't know about WhatsApp or how it worked. I didn't even make the whole pitch. He heard that and immediately suggested we message on there, and then encouraged me to delete our regular text convo once we were talking there. Once I had him hooked on the made-up 17-year-old girl, I sent all the chat logs and pics he sent to her, to the principal and the school district main office, using every email address I could find on the school district website and social media pages. Within three days of the emails being sent, we had a sub. All we were told was that Mr. Smith had to go take some time off due to, quote, personal issues. I still don't know what happened to him after that. I graduated about three months after he was put on leave and never heard or saw him again. I joined the military and left town about six months after this all happened and have not returned to that city since. One of my friends who still lives there told me a while back that he saw him working the deli counter at a grocery store not far from where the high school was. I never told a single soul and nobody knows it was me. The rumor mill went wild about him being a pedophile, but nobody knew I had anything to do with it, even though I benefited the most from his departure. I imagine they tracked the girl down and asked her, but obviously she didn't know him. However, the chat logs from WhatsApp show the girl telling him she was 17 about three days before he sent his first, of many, pictures so that was probably enough to at least get him fired and lose his teaching certification. In the state this all happened in, the age of consent is 16. Legally, he could have hooked up with her. I was never looking to get him in legal trouble. Just mess with him enough to get him out of my life, that's all. I agree it was messed up for me to use her pictures. I was 17, and I didn't know any girls I would have been comfortable asking, Hey, wanna catfish Mr. Smith and ruin his life? Also, don't tell anyone. To this day, I have no idea why my dad called him a pedo. Maybe his ex-wife told my dad when he was handling her divorce about something he did. The tone I heard my dad say it in led me to believe that something like this would be worth a shot. Obviously, his ex and my dad took him to the cleaners in the divorce settlement, hence what kicked off the whole series of events. I don't regret it, but I would never go so far on anyone again. I was a bitter, moody teen, but when you're being bullied by someone with authority over you, you have to do what you have to do to survive. When I was still young and dumb, I met a girl on a snowboarding forum and we began falling in love or so I thought. I lived in North Carolina and she lived in Michigan. I was so dumb in fact that I went as far as to buy an extra cell phone to add to my plan and sent it to her so we could keep in closer touch without the added charges for text or calling. This was back before Skype and even before camera phones were the norm, so all I had to go on was a couple of pictures she emailed me. A couple of months go by and things started to feel different somehow. She would take hours to respond to my messages and would rarely ever answer my phone calls. But because the phone was on my cell plan, I could easily check all the voicemails I left her to see if they had been listened to or deleted etc. There was one voicemail I managed to hear before she could delete it from another guy saying something to the effect of, I love you baby. I used the message details to find out the other guy's phone number and called him. Turns out, he was on the same boat I was in. They had met online and she was beginning to ghost him. Only difference is, he lived in Michigan. So we concocted a plan to meet up and confront her together so she had nowhere to run. 
I drove to Michigan, about 13 hours, met him, worked up a plan to coax her out of her dorm room and ambush her. It went flawlessly. Best part, it was also her birthday. She was nothing at all like the pic she had sent me, not even the same girl. She was using the pics of some girl she went to school with. I got my phone back and drove back to NC. It wasn't all for loss though. A friend of hers that was staying in the dorm room eventually contacted me to congratulate me on such an epic bust. They all thought she was a real ass, and it was glorious to see her outed like that. This girl and I met up a few times, hooked up once or twice, and have been friends ever since. I was a catfish for three years, or what was called a fake before the TV show. It started out on a website called Tagged, which is almost just like Facebook, but less game invites. I was 11 when I discovered it, and being the kid I was with low self-esteem, I decided that I wasn't going to use pictures of myself, but someone else. I didn't start out with the mindset of tricking people or creating emotional attachments with them, I was just an 11-year-old girl who was too embarrassed to use her own face. It wasn't long before I showed my genius idea to my best friend at the time, and then it wasn't long after that she joined me on the website with her own fake name and fake face. We created a backstory for our two new identities. We were fraternal twin sisters who lived separately and in different states. We decided on that to explain the lack of pictures together you'd be surprised how many people were actually fooled by that. And after that, it just snowballed. I would describe the feeling as a power trip. My fake sister and I became virtual queens of that website, at least at the time we were. We had many people convinced that we were the real deal. People defended us against others that claimed we weren't the real thing. At the time, it felt great. All the attention was overwhelming. The compliments that weren't meant for me felt real, and I never wanted it to end. But, just like all things, it came to an end about two years later. I made many, many friends on that website, but I never actually entered a romantic relationship or anything. That comes way later. The friends I made on that website are people I will never forget, but eventually they stopped logging on, and so did we. However, that wasn't the end. A friend of ours on Tagged told us that he was moving websites, and so we decided to go with him, and so started the reign on a website called My Yearbook, the cesspool of all social media. Starting out there was a little bit harder. There were already people who had established themselves on that website, so the backlash from that was a bit more harsh. You never knew when you were going to add someone who was going to spam your profile to shreds. The catfish's worst nightmare. But it was on this website that I met someone who became very important to me. Let's call him Aaron. Aaron was the first and only person I developed a somewhat romantic relationship with. As romantic as it can get for a 13-year-old, that is. The development in our relationship was fast, really fast. In a few months, I felt closer to him than I did to any other people I had met during this time in my life. Eventually, it escalated to phone calls and texting, which were okay with me. He couldn't see my face, and that's all that mattered. But when he wanted to video chat, excuses became harder to come up with, and then he told me that he loved me. That was the final straw. I couldn't do it anymore. I had had people profess their love to me before throughout this whole escapade, but never had it felt so genuine as it did when he said it. I knew stuff about him that not even his real-life friends knew. So I talked it out with my fake sister, aka best friend, and we decided to call it quits and come clean to him. To say that he was furious was an understatement. That conversation was hard, and then it was over very quickly and he refused to ever talk to me again. Not that I can blame him. Since then, I haven't catfished. I've lost all contact with anyone I knew in that time span, and Aaron has gone down a bad path that I feel is partially my fault. 
so if you ever feel like catfishing is a good idea, you're wrong. It's horrible to mess with people's emotions like that, and it's horrible to mess with your own emotions. Just don't do it. It's a bad idea. This was a year ago. An attractive woman had contacted me on Facebook and explained that she was moving into my area from across the country and came across my profile. She wanted to start making friends so wouldn't feel too alone when she moved and thought that I looked friendly. Now, an intelligent response to this would have probably consisted of looking into their profile and friends to see what kind of person you're dealing with, but I got a little caught up on her pictures. Having recently gone through a rough breakup, I wanted to believe, and I let myself do so like it was my first day on the internet. We talked for hours, learning about each other, talking about pretty mundane stuff. As the night went on, she became drunk, and we switched to juicier conversations. Within an hour, she had sent me three nude pictures, all stunning. She wanted some of me, but that's not really my thing. She begged for one, just one, and I would be rewarded with one more of her. Reluctantly, I sent her a well-crafted, as well as it could be at least, perfectly lit picture of my mostly nude body. Nope, she wanted to see it all. Cue another two hours of breaking me down, and I ended up launching a picture of myself across the web. She's happy, she says we'll talk tomorrow, and goes off. I then pulled the images she sent to me and noticed they're of different qualities, some over-compressed, some high-res, etc. I'm suspicious. I finally did what I should have done from the beginning and take a closer look at her profile. She seems pretty one-dimensional, which isn't especially surprising. Then I noticed she has 513 friends, 494 of which were men. Yeah, I counted. The reality is starting to sink in. I opened up Google Images and do a reverse image search on the pictures she sent me. Boom. Hundreds of hits on amateur porn sites. Damn. I was in my early 20s at the time and met a girl on one of the chat boards. She was 19 or so and was attractive. She had several pictures available, all of which were candid shots and none of the stereotypical model-like photos, so I tended to believe it was legit. After a while, we started talking on the phone and it progressed into a casual relationship and inevitably led to many discussions about sex and fantasies and even borderline phone sex. The thing is, she lived in the same city as me, so after a month or so, I was saying, hey, we need to meet or this isn't going anywhere. She finally gave me her address and tells me to come over the next day. I show up, and it's a very sketchy part of town. It's near the penitentiary, and the house probably should have been condemned a few years prior. I start to realize this is a bad idea, but I wanted to see it through and there was a girl about the same age sitting out front of the house. She knew who I was and said she was the girl's friend and that she would be back soon so we should just wait for her. This other girl was nice enough but was very overweight. She probably had an extra 40 pounds on her frame and didn't resemble the girl in the photos at all. Well, soon enough, she gets me into the house and up into the bedroom and she's talking to me like she's my friend and knows me, etc. I think she was trying to make a move on me, but the entire time I was in horror due to this house. I mean, the place was disgusting. There was garbage everywhere. The bed was just a stained mattress with a partial sheet covering part of it. There was no place to sit aside from the floor. The place smelled like old ashtrays, and in the middle of the summer, there was no AC so it was stuffy and hot. However, I still didn't think it was the same girl because I just didn't recognize the voice as being the same. Eventually, it became clear the girl I was expecting wasn't going to show, 
so I said goodbye and left. She then contacted me on the phone later and had some sad excuses. She then went out of her way to tell me not to get her confused with her friend because their voices sound a lot alike and then she made a little comment about her friend being overweight to which I responded something like, yeah, she was a fatty and she tried to brush it off but you could tell she was offended. Eventually, I figured things out and she denied it but we stopped talking. A few months go by and she contacts me and says she's dating some guy, I suppose in an attempt to make me jealous, but I wasn't. Then, a month or so later, she calls me to tell me she's pregnant and had all this drama. I just stopped answering her calls and her emails were more excuses trying to explain why we never met. The whole thing was just odd and I can't believe it took me so long to see the warning signs. A few years later, the house she was living in was torn down by the city and is now an empty lot. I have no idea whatever happened to her. I'm ashamed to admit this, but I once catfished my ex. When I was in my mid-teens, I was incredibly hung up over my ex for a good two years. He was the first guy I ever dated, and by hung up, I mean mildly obsessed. At the time, we were on terrible terms because we had had a breakup, and despite being in the same grade and class at school, he pretty much acted as though I didn't exist. We'll call him Brian. In my desperation to reconnect with Brian, I left a comment on his blog's mini-chat, back in the day when it was fashionable for everyone to have a blog, pretending to be a random girl that happened to come across his blog. We'll call her Vivian. One thing led to another, and we actually started having a sort of online relationship where we communicated via email. I was convinced that when I eventually revealed my true identity to Brian, he would feel the same way towards me as he did for Vivian because apart from the different name, Vivian was essentially the same person I was. I managed to keep this up for a good month or so and life had never been better. Brian had shyly declared his love for Vivian and we were getting to know each other better than Brian and I ever had in our short-lived relationship. Until one day, in my excitement and impatience to reply to one of Brian's emails, I responded on my newly set up iPod Touch and sent the email off without bothering to check it through. I didn't realize until later that my iPod had helpfully added my real first name to the end of the email. I immediately freaked the hell out of course and tried to play it off by sending a casual follow-up email to Brian saying that I was using my sister's iPod Touch to respond because my computer was broken, hence the odd signature. Unfortunately, my real name is fairly uncommon and I knew that it would be a pretty hard story to swallow. He seemed to accept my excuse and we continued to exchange a few more emails but they were pretty half-hearted from his end so I knew that something was definitely off. When I checked Brian's blog a couple of days later, I saw that a friend of his had replied to one of my or Vivian's messages on the mini chat telling me to stop my BS and stringing Brian along busted. The most messed up part was that I had just started seeing another guy, Simon, around the time that I was catfishing Brian. I know, I know, I'm not proud of this. Brian turned to our mutual friend and my then best friend, John, to be a mediator and issued an ultimatum saying that he would tell Simon what I did the following day unless I confessed to Simon first. Thankfully, John managed to talk him down from this and Simon never found out. Things got infinitely more awkward between Brian and me whenever we happened to cross paths in school, but he never confronted me about the catfishing. Funny thing is that we eventually started talking again a couple of years later and developed a fairly decent, superficial friendship. But to this day, we have never, ever mentioned the incident. This was really before catfishing became a term we used, though the act itself had been around as long as social media has. 
This was back during my freshman year of college, and it was during the MySpace era. In college, I made friends with someone in my honors colloquium class, Leslie, and she in turn introduced me to many of her other friends, who then became my friends. They had all known each other for years, but were very welcoming to me. I felt very much like part of the group. That being said, I didn't really know them that well when this happened. What they did seemed, well, not like them, but then I realized I didn't exactly know what was like them. A member of the group, Catherine, was going away to school in Boston, and so the night before, we all decided to have a going away party of sorts. We were going to visit another friend, Tamara, who was going to school in Philadelphia, which was about an hour away, and then we were going to just have fun in the city. Our designated meeting place to drive down there was Dunkin' Donuts. When I got there, Leslie was there with our friends Samantha and Anthony, and Leslie looked pissed. She was sitting there with her arms crossed, kind of staring at nothing but with an angry look on her face. As for Samantha and Anthony, they kept looking at the door, and they seemed both nervous and shifty. I could tell they were on edge. I sat down at the table of awkwardness, since we had to wait on Catherine and a couple of more friends, and things got awkward when no one was talking. Finally, I was just like, what is the deal with you three? Leslie replied, you should ask them, gesturing to Anthony and Samantha. They suddenly looked guilty, but before they could answer, the door opened again, and they both went from looking guilty to anxious and mildly scared. I looked to the door and saw just a normal guy, pretty nondescript. When he walked in, he kind of glanced around the room like he was looking for someone. Anthony and Samantha wouldn't say anything. Leslie just kept huffing and shaking her head. All three kept looking over at this guy as he sat down. As soon as Catherine and the others got there, it was like we couldn't get out of there fast enough. Catherine, our friends Evan and Julie, and I were very confused. It was on the way to Philadelphia that we learned the truth. It was Leslie who told us. Apparently, Anthony and Samantha had created a fake MySpace account, and they had been catfishing this guy, Calvin. We didn't know the term catfishing yet, but that's what it was. They had created a fake account using a picture of an actress or singer or something, I can't remember, only her face was obscured. Apparently, this had been going on for a couple of weeks, and the conversations had gotten serious, like Calvin seemed to really like this fake girl they had created. I didn't know why they did this, and when I asked them, they didn't really have a reason. Mostly, they were just bored. It turned out that they had told him to meet at that Dunkin' Donuts at the time we were there. I think that once he showed up, Anthony and Samantha realized that this wasn't just a game, that Calvin was a real person with real feelings, and I do think they felt badly about what they had done, but it was too late. They couldn't take it back. There was no reason they had chosen Calvin. He was just some random guy they had picked. I guess Leslie had found out about it a couple of days prior and told them to end it, and that was why she was so angry with them, because they had told her what had happened, that Calvin was supposed to be there. After that, I never really saw Anthony and Samantha in the same way. These weren't really people I wanted to be friends with, especially when I saw the messages and saw how much they had gotten Calvin to like them. I thought this would be the end of it. I was wrong. About a week later, everyone came to my house for pizza and just to hang out, and Samantha and Anthony told us that they had gotten messages from Calvin. I didn't think much of it because I already knew he had been messaging their fake account, wanting to know why she had stood him up, and he seemed upset, especially when this fake girl stopped replying. But no, that wasn't what Samantha and Anthony meant. He hadn't messaged the fake account, he had messaged their accounts. I remember them telling me that, my sharp intake of breath, the way my heart rate increased, that unnerved me. The messages were more of the same, but also Calvin made it clear that he knew what they had done, and he seemed even angrier. Anthony in particular got a very long, furious message from Calvin. I don't want to say that they deserved it, but honestly, they had done a crappy thing, and there were some consequences. I figured it would die down in a couple of days. It didn't. A few days after Calvin had messaged Anthony and Samantha, 
he started messaging the rest of us who had been in Dunkin' Donuts that night. Now this really scared me. Keep in mind that I was already dealing with another stalker situation, so I was understandably on edge, and this guy had found me. I didn't know much about computers, but I thought he must have traced Anthony and Samantha's IP addresses or something, since they had used their own computers for the account. But when it came to the rest of us, we didn't understand. How had he found us? My theory is that once he found Anthony and Samantha, he looked through their friends and recognized us from the pictures, but I don't know for sure. All of his messages came from MySpace, so at least he wasn't texting us and stuff. But still, his messages were very angry. He kept saying things like, How could you do this to me? And you made a fool of me. How dare you? I thought about replying, but Evan had done that already, telling Calvin that we weren't responsible, and he didn't believe him. Honestly, Evan totally sold Anthony and Samantha out, but we figured that Calvin already knew that they were the ringleaders. He just didn't know they were the sole perpetrators, instead thinking we all had a hand in it. I figured there was no point to defend myself, since Calvin didn't believe Evan when he had tried. This went on for a couple of weeks, and it seemed like Calvin was getting increasingly angry the more we, quote, ignored him, because that's what he said we were doing. Finally, I had had enough, and was like, for goodness sake. I replied and told him again that we weren't responsible, corroborating Evan's story. I didn't actually put all the blame on Anthony and Samantha, but I told Calvin that it was just a couple of people in the group. Then I apologized, though I think that only made him angrier. He didn't believe anything we said, so I blocked him. We all did, but he just kept making new accounts. In two weeks, he probably made three different profiles, in addition to the one he had had at the beginning. When I finally defended myself, Calvin messaged me back and said, You made me into a fool, an idiot, and one day you'll know how that feels. I think you will. Maybe it was because of everything else that had happened with this guy, but that sounded like a threat, like he was going to personally make sure I knew how we had made him feel. We were lucky. As far as I know, Calvin never did anything beyond message us aggressively. It could have been a lot worse. Eventually, Calvin stopped messaging us, and then he deleted his account. I felt bad for the guy, and Samantha and Anthony had been wrong, but what Calvin was doing to us was wrong too, the harassment. Eventually, he stopped though after a couple of months, and I never saw him again. I slowly drifted apart from the group, first Anthony and Samantha for obvious reasons, then Catherine, Julie, Evan and Leslie. I wasn't too broken up about the first two because they weren't the kind of people I really wanted to be friends with. Not only had they done a crappy thing, they had brought Calvin into our lives, like opening a door and inviting someone. This is complicated. When I was 15, my dad brought in our first household computer. I was totally addicted to the Annie Rice novels, The Vampire Chronicles. Well, the first thing I do is look up all those super awesome websites. I end up coming across a message board. Now, at the time, I had no idea what roleplay was, and this is the mid-90s, and on this board, people play the vampires from the books. They had instant messages as these vampires, and you could talk to them and email them. It was a pretty badass place, and I totally got into it. Like, they had never break character. Even going so far as to only log in to Instant Messenger when the sun had gone down in their geographical location. So me being the inexperienced, closeted gay teenager, start getting obsessed with this board. I start talking to different vampires, and I end up talking to one a lot on Instant Messenger. I admit my gayness, and he falls in love with me. Thus begins a torrid online affair with a vampire. He even broke character. It messed with my mind a bit. This relationship goes on for months. Cybersex, love letters. He even makes me a website declaring his love for me. And then, my father finds out. He loses it, 
decides I'm being taken advantage of, which, looking back now, I totally was. He calls the cops and puts me in a mental hospital. Meanwhile, the vampire goes underground, freaking out because the cops got a hold of his email and messenger name. When I get out of the hospital, first thing I do is get to a computer to message him. He says to me, you're dead to me. I've already had your funeral. I'm utterly destroyed. The cops never find out who he is. I have to rebuild my teenage psyche. Fast forward a few years. Turns out the gay vampire who helped me accept my sexuality was actually a 40-something year old single mother of two with major issues. So, yeah. Funnily enough, I ended up finding my way back to the board a few years later and ended up becoming one of the characters on the board, and I ended up meeting her. Like I said, she had issues, even talked in a fake French accent, and she was from Ohio. When I was a teenager, I spoke to a girl on MSN called Trinity every day for five or six years, up until I was about 20-ish. She was one of my best friends. We talked about everything, shared so many secrets. She'd send me photos all the time, but I could never get her on a webcam to see her alive and moving. I offered to send her one in the mail. She was in Iowa, I'm in the UK, but she refused. She'd slip up from time to time and I'd get suspicious, but I was going through a lot of messed up stuff and I was desperate for someone outside of my real life to help me escape, so I always managed to overlook the little holes in the story. I saved a lot of money hoping to fly out to visit her stateside, but the timing was never right or something always came up. And then one day, she was in London. She wanted to meet up. I went to the agreed spot, a busy train station in London, and waited, and waited. Three hours later, and she never showed. Apparently, her parents wouldn't let her out in London alone, at the age of 18, and when I offered to come to her, there was always some excuse. I stopped trying and after a while, my real life started to take over, and we talked less and less. The dream started to crumble. MSN stopped being a thing, and we stopped talking, and then Facebook happened. She added me, and her wall was filled with teenage guys saying they loved her and missed her. Some called her Mexican, some Puerto Rican. The guy she told me was her boyfriend was tagged as her brother, etc, etc. The whole thing crumbled in minutes. Years of companionship just vanished. I freaked, sent her a bunch of messages demanding she come clean. I begged for the truth, but all I got was silence. The profile disappeared, the email account went dead, and I never heard from her again. The worst part is that whoever it was never had the guts to come clean. After years of talking, they just bailed. That's the worst part, not knowing why, being thrown away. It was scathing. I was going on vacation for nearly two weeks, the longest trip I had been on. My parents were taking their two adult children, me and my little brother, and my brother's girlfriend. I'm kind of a fifth wheel. I'm not super into the beach. I like to explore or read more than I enjoy drinking on the beach. So I turn to online dating for companions from near home. I start talking to like six people, but slowly whittle down to one. She's fantastic lives within an hour of me, and she calls me every day. I spent a ton of time on the phone, and we plan to meet as soon as I return. Lots of phone sex, dirty pics, perfect long distance thing. She starts dropping the L word, talking about how I'm her one. I'm made a bit nervous about this, because she's talking about her amateur modeling career. I find her Facebook, and she's a bit heavier than she lets on, but I don't let her know that I know. Well, I return a day early and ask her to meet me in the city nearby to eat. She says yes, and we plan it for the next day. 
I leave my home and she only has sent one text that day, quote, I'm nervous. She doesn't respond to another of my texts, but I hit the road anyway and show up at our date. She doesn't show. She doesn't answer my messages. After 45 minutes, I eat alone. I leave after a consolation beer. I tell her not to darken my doorstep or consider contacting me. She doesn't. Finally, after a week, I get pissed about being lonely and hurt and I ask her why she catfished me. She said she couldn't make herself leave her room that day and she was miserable about it. She also said that she didn't want to meet me. That's okay, I went back to talking to others and actually had a few fun dates but no real big romance. Now I avoid people who throw the L word around and get real familiar too quick. I was catfished over a long period of time. When I was in junior year of high school, my parents got a job offer out of state and I was forced to move across the country. I started a new school late into the academic year, mid-March, and had a hard time fitting into the new school. All I wanted was to make friends, but was too shy to talk to anyone. It was around this time that my friends left MySpace to join Facebook, so I did the same to keep close to them. Some days later, I received a friend request from David. David was a guy that I had been friends with in my old town. Well, he wasn't exactly my friend, but rather the friend of another friend. My friend Jerry had introduced him to the group and would bring him along every time all of us hung out. We knew David was a year older than us and that he had gone to a different school, but other than that, we really didn't know anything about him. In fact, we kind of always just referred to him as Jerry's friend because he never even bothered to talk to any of us. So when I received a friend request from him on Facebook, I was more than confused. He had hardly spoken to me when I had lived near him, so for him to want to be friends with me after all of this time just seemed a little strange, but I was so lonely and desperate for friends that I didn't care. Other than that, nothing really seemed off about him, at least not at the time. Looking back, I do remember that he hardly had any pictures or friends when I first accepted his request. But like I said, this was around the time that people had just started using Facebook, so it didn't seem all that weird for him to have such a barren profile. And over the years, his friend list got a lot bigger, even more so than mine, so I didn't really think anything of it. But anyway, I digress. I accepted his friend request, and it was just like this that David and I became friends. He told me how he had just started university and that he was lonely because he was too shy to make friends. I told him that I was having a hard time in my new school for the same reasons and we bonded over that. Little by little, we started talking more. He shared his problems with me and I shared mine with him. And when it was time for me to apply to university, he even helped me out. He taught me how to sign up for my SATs helped me to apply for scholarships and even paid for one of my application fees using a visa gift card so I didn't receive any of his personal information and he didn't receive any of mine. Then, when I finally started university, he helped with that as well. He told me where to buy books, gave me studying tips, provided emotional support, so when he asked for my phone number, I didn't even hesitate to give it to him. David was my best friend and I wanted to keep him close, even if we were physically away from each other. It was around this time David started sharing more of his life with me and all of it was pretty normal stuff. He had a job at Pizza Hut, which he hated, but needed to keep in order to pay for his bills. He also played soccer, but not for his university or anything. It was just a group of guys that got together on the weekends to unwind. I think the biggest thing he told me was that he had flunked out of university and that I was the only one that knew because he was too embarrassed to tell anyone else. And at one point, he also had to move back in with his mum, which he hated a lot. Two, maybe three years into our friendship, my family decides to take a trip back to the city where we had lived prior to moving all across the country and I excitedly tell him and all of my old high school friends. Most of them were pretty excited about the idea of all of us hanging out together again because after high school, we had just gone our different ways. 
but when I contacted David about it, he showed little interest in hanging out with us. I thought it was weird. You know, I wasn't some stranger he had met online, but rather someone who had been in his life for many years. I kept insisting and asking for a reason, and then he finally gave me one. He told me that his pictures had been heavily edited, and that he was afraid of disappointing me if we met in real life. I told him that it didn't matter what he looked like, and that I just wanted to meet him, but he still didn't want to hang out. Instead, he just started being a huge dick to me. He knew exactly what buttons to push, knew all of my insecurities and secrets, and had started using all of that knowledge to hurt me, so I just stopped talking to him. Some weeks later, I meet my friends as planned, and much to my surprise, I see David there, looking just like he did on his pictures. I didn't understand why he had lied about photoshopping his pictures, or why he had said he didn't want to meet me, only for him to show at our friend's house. But I was so angry at him that I didn't ask any questions. I just kept waiting for an apology, but David wouldn't approach me. He was treating me like he treated me back when we were in high school. I was really upset, but given that he had been such a huge dig to me, I just figured that this was just another attempt at getting under my skin. We were all drinking and talking about what we were up to, and then it was his time to share. He pretty much just said the same things I already knew about him. He said that he wished that he was still in university like the rest of us, but that he had flunked out, and that he was just living with his mum. He said that he was miserable there, and that he wanted to move out, but that his job at Pizza Hut wasn't paying him enough for him to move out on his own. At this point though, I was already pretty pissed off and the alcohol had given me enough courage to finally ask him why he had been ignoring me. He apologized, but admitted that he hardly remembered me, which hurt my feelings but also pissed me off even more. I told him about Facebook and about our text messages, and he just kept insisting that he didn't use Facebook. Apparently, he had used MySpace at one point, but had dropped using that when he switched over to Tumblr. A Facebook account was something that he hadn't even considered making, I asked him about the text messages, and he just said that I probably confused him with another David because he had never had my number. I thought that denying it was a lousy excuse, but Jerry backed him, which pissed me off even more. The thing though was that David hadn't just been talking to me on Facebook, but also to a bunch of us. So when we kept calling him out on this, he just told us to text this David guy to prove that it wasn't him. He set his phone on the table and I texted him, but no new messages appeared on his phone. Then, while we were all arguing about how we need to give it some time, the David that I had been talking to for years responds, proving that we had been talking to a fake all along. Things turned pretty awkward at this point with all of us feeling angry and betrayed, and David obviously feeling extremely violated. So with all of us wanting answers, we open up our friend's laptop and search for David's profile on Facebook. The first thing that David points out is that whoever this was, they were using his mother's maiden name and not his real last name, and that while most of the people on his friends list were people that he knew in real life, none of them were people that he kept in contact with. His display picture was also of a dog which he had owned for years, but that had since died just like the fake David had told me. All measures that, looking back, I'm guessing were used by this person to keep David's close friends from actually finding him on Facebook. The older pictures on Facebook had been taken from his MySpace back when he was still using that, but most of the newer ones had been taken from his Tumblr, which he apparently uploaded to pretty often. The weirdest thing though was that there were some pictures he swore he had never seen before, these were all pictures of his soccer games taken from the audience, which the fake David had said his brother had taken. The real David said his brother never went to his games, neither did any of his family members or friends. Further exploring his own fake profile, David pointed out that while a bunch of status updates were of things that had never happened, a lot of them were accurate. Whoever this person was, they had been watching David for a long time. They knew his schedule, knew what movies he went to, knew what ice cream flavors he liked, knew his favorite bands, knew practically everything about him. We did confront the fake David, but he never answered the text messages, 
and instead deleted the profile before we had a chance to examine it any further, so we never did get any answers. I don't know why this person pretended to be David for so long, or why they even did it in the first place. All I know is that I felt extremely violated for having shared so many private details of my life with him, and of course, I also felt a great deal of pity for the real David. I wondered for the longest time how this person found him and how they managed to learn so many private details of his life. Then, a few months back, my mother calls me saying that she found a profile with her name, but my picture's on it. My middle name is my mum's first name, something that very few people know. She thought that I had made a second profile, and I didn't tell her the truth because I didn't want to scare her, but truth was that I didn't even know that profile existed. I have always kept Facebook set to private, and I no longer accept random friend requests, nor do I post my pictures anywhere else. So this profile only had really old pictures of me, and nothing weird like David's soccer game pictures, but it was still active, and had been active for a while. None of the friends were people that I know, and none of the updates were things that I've been doing in real life, so I don't know if the profile belonged to the same person that stalked David, but I'm extremely average looking, so I don't know why anyone would want to use my pictures when there are way prettier girls online. So I'm guessing it had to be him. I don't know, I just reported the profile and it no longer exists, but I wonder if this person is still pretending to be me or if they've moved on to somebody else. Okay, this started when I was 17, back in the day of the old Nokia 7210 and WAP instead of Wi-Fi. I joined a social networking site, a mix between Reddit and Facebook, all anonymous and pictures were only just able to be uploaded. It was me and I used my actual pictures, as did most people. Not unlike Reddit, the place was a decent community full of banter and flirting but I never really wanted more than to chat when I was bored. Although I did meet a number of people from there and still have them on Facebook now. I was talking to a girl. I was 17, she was 16. We spoke for months, literally almost a year, and called each other daily. I was besotted. She was beautiful and I wondered why the hell someone so beautiful and actually a decent woman would like me. After a year, we arranged to meet. She lived in my city anyway, so it would be easy. We decided to meet in Asda, the supermarket, because we were both about 10 minutes from there. She didn't show up. After, she said she did show up, and saw me, and described what I was wearing, and said she bottled out because I looked amazing and she didn't deserve me. Anyway, a month and a few more failed meets went by, and I got fed up and decided to call it a day. She called and said she didn't meet me because she lied about herself, then showed me a picture of herself. Completely not my type. Fast forward nine years, and she had crossed paths with me a few times, but nothing odd. But one night, I'm in bed and hear a knock on my window. I'm in a ground floor flat. I look out, and there's a random woman there. It's her. I had a mini fit and told her to go away. I have no idea how she found my address, as I moved several times over the years. I also used to get random friend requests on Facebook, and random texts even when I changed my number. Bit creepy. A few days ago it hit me that this guy I had met online basically sort of catfished me and that our relationship was beyond creepy and inappropriate. I'm a female and trust and believe I've dated a psychopath as in they got diagnosed with it after we broke up but that's more of an abuse survivor tale so I know creepy and inappropriate. Anyway... Harken back with me to the days of yesteryear when dial-up was the only way to connect to the internet and AOL was in its heyday. I was 12 years old when my little internet addiction started, but I was still pretty innocent and naive to the ways of the world. 
oftentimes I would get to go on to a specific moderated chat room that was basically nothing more than a roleplay chat. So, spoilers, I was and am a huge nerd, and I got very into roleplaying once I was introduced to it. I would go into this chat every single day. Writing had been my passion since I was 10, and I had been creating stories and characters for the past two years. I was insanely happy I found an outlet for my creativity, and that I had other people to do it with me. I met some of my best friends in that chat, and had made a lifelong friend with one of them. My character was everything you could imagine a naive 12-year-old who thought writing about characters, French kissing, was naughty and slowly introduced to anime could be a hot mess, to be honest. It was in this chat where I met a certain character who was being roleplayed by a kid named John. I really cannot tell you what drew him to me, as my character was a weebo, anime feel and Japanophil basically, nightmare piloted by a girl who was a hyper but friendly mess. It never, ever occurred to me that older teenagers or even adults would be in this room. It was mainly aimed at kids. I was never afraid to talk to anyone in the chat. So when John approached me, we were role-playing, so basically we spoke through our characters. I know mine was a huge part of me and was basically an online persona, which is important to note for this story. I was eager to role-play and talk with him. After about a week or two of building up our relationship, he messaged me and asked if it was okay if we talked in private. Sure, no problem. We talked about anything and everything, although it was nothing creepy or invasive. He asked my age, so I told him I was 12, and when I asked for his, he was 13. Oh, sweet, a new friend around my age. A couple of weeks pass, and I'm beginning to develop a crush on John. We talked every night and roleplay every night. He was very sweet and understanding and listened to my childish woes about the pains of seventh grade. Eventually, he asked me if I would be his girlfriend, and when I asked him if he just meant roleplay wise, he said no, he wanted to date me for real. Ecstatic, I accepted. A seemingly unspoken rule in the chat is that whenever two RPers got together, their characters did too so we roleplayed all kinds of couple cutesy stuff in the chat. Fast forward two months, and I'm at my best friend's. She introduced me to the chat and knew all about John and even began talking to him. I was spending the night and taking a shower while she talked to John. Suddenly I hear, uh, witch king? And I step out, not quite done with my shower, and open the door. Her bedroom is connected to the bathroom, and I peeked out. She tells me, John just told me he lied about his age and that he's actually 15. That really should have been my first sign, but like I said, I was a naive 12-year-old and the realization didn't occur to me that this was messed up until over a decade later, like a few days ago actually. I'm 23 and just now realize the signs. I what the hell for a moment at this new information, then told her to ask him why he lied to me. He said it was because he was afraid I wouldn't like him because he was too old and that he just really enjoyed my company and being my boyfriend that he didn't want to say anything. But now he just felt guilty and wanted to confess to me the truth. I really didn't think anything of it. I just tell her to tell him that I accept him no matter what and that I didn't care about his age because I, quote, loved him. Mistake. A few months passed and John and my best friend Rue have gotten much closer and talk on a regular basis. During that time, we had a little after school dance and we had our pictures taken together and somehow the topic came up when she was talking to John and he asked if he could see the picture so he could see what we looked like. I was raised never to do this so I was kind of freaked out but kind of excited at the same time because he sent me a picture of himself and he was just so gosh darn cute. I don't know the whole story, but Rue said essentially that he thought I was beautiful. I laugh at this now because I was just being a ham for the picture and decked out in goth attire, and that Rue was very cute herself. Of course I got jealous and quickly told her to stop. It never occurred to me until now that he was the one seducing her. 
She confessed to me how much she liked him, and we got into a fight and stopped talking for a few months. Meanwhile, they were still talking. During the months that Rue and I were not talking, John had yet again made another confession. He was actually 18 years old, and even sent proof by way of a picture of him with his high school swim team. Again, a red flag, who knows how old he really is. And again, I'm a naive 12, almost 13 year old, who was in love with him, so I didn't care. That was when we began talking on the phone every day I came home after school. I was stupid enough to give him my home phone number, and he called every school day like clockwork. He would do most of the talking, and I would do most of the listening. A lot of it was just innocent stuff, but I was much shyer on the phone than online for some reason. So, I do remember he insisted that his friend who was in the car with him one day really wanted to talk to me, and I could hear him begging in the background, so it was apparent people knew about me. I'm pretty sure they didn't know my true age though, otherwise, who knows? Anyhow, a few days after my 13th birthday, his character and my character got married for a birthday present, which meant they could have, quote, sex. This idea honestly never occurred to me until he proposed it, and I was initially very, very uncomfortable with the idea, but I didn't want to upset or disappoint him because he seemed disappointed when I hesitated, but was quick to say that he didn't want to pressure me, but he did many times. Remember, our characters were basically an online avatar of ourselves, even his. So an 18-year-old was role-playing what had to be the stupidest sex scene ever written in history with a 13-year-old who had no idea how the mechanics of sex worked. But he, or his character, was very gentle and loving and romantic, and just like every romance I had ever watched. So I was not opposed to doing it again in the future, although I had no idea what I was doing and was not at all turned on by what was happening. It still even made me a little uncomfortable every time, even though I was growing used to it. Now I look back on it, I realize he was grooming me. During the months Rue and I were not talking, her father found out about John and went ballistic, going so far as to blaming me for putting her in danger, but I honestly had no idea what the danger was, and I had not done that to her intentionally, obviously, but in retrospect, I knew he was trying to protect us. A few weeks after, I broke it off with John to date another very sweet boy a year older than me. We met when I was 15 and he was 16 in real life, supervised by my mum of course. He's so sweet, she wishes we were still together sometimes, and we talk like once or twice a year still. I decided to instant message Rue and apologize profusely to her. She said that she couldn't hang out with me because her dad was really angry with me because of the John thing. So after we set up a call between me and him, in which I apologized and explained to him that I never meant to put Rue in danger and that I would never do that intentionally, he forgave me, but did request I change my AOL profile so people would not have easy access to finding it. Done and done. All was right in the world once more. Ah, but it doesn't end there. A few weeks into my new relationship, John began messaging me most every night just to talk. He said he saw me RPing goofy romantic stuff with my new boyfriend in the public chat room and that it genuinely hurt him to see it. I felt really, really guilty, especially when he finally told me that he was in love with me. I was conflicted. My new boyfriend, Dave, was like my best friend and I was in puppy love with him, but I still sort of liked John and felt really bad that I had just dumped him out of the blue, which were his words, and he was my first love, so he was still special to me at the time. Eventually, like two months or so, I broke it off with Dave to get back together with John and the sexual role-playing that I was still uncomfortable with started right back up. I didn't realize the power dynamic was skewed in the relationship. I don't want to think of it as abusive, but it was very manipulative and inappropriate. He would constantly pressure and talk me into doing sexual scenes. He even began mocking my character and Dave's in the chat at times, 
and he was always doing things like kissing my character or grabbing her whenever Dave was in the room, like I or my character was his property. It was very embarrassing for me, and while I did not actually tell him to stop, it was clear by the actions I played out through my character that I was uncomfortable with the whole situation. Eventually, a few weeks before my freshman year began, I broke it off with John once more and started dating Dave again, who I could just gush about for ages. I stopped roleplaying in the two public chats dedicated to it and talked to or roleplayed with my friends exclusively through IM only. There was never any pressure to do anything with Dave. We just roleplayed silly little scenes between our characters and it eventually blossomed into a very serious relationship which I told my mum all about, although I was reluctant at first because I was afraid she would ban me from the internet. I never did tell her about John. No one knows about him except me and Rue as her father passed three years ago and she only knows so much about the relationship. Anyways, I didn't fully stop communicating with John he said he was now in the marines and would send me emails on occasion. I first began to get scared when he said he was trying to eventually finish being trained at a fort a few hours south of where I lived. I never, ever told him where I lived, but he did have my phone number, so I guess it's just a matter of finding the area code. Or maybe he really did know where I lived. If so, that was the only inclination he gave of knowing the general area of where I was. I didn't get anything in the mail or any calls from him or an anonymous source, so there's one blessing. In the emails, he would constantly talk about how much he missed me, how he really wants me back, and that we were soulmates. I never humored him, but I did still continue to communicate with him, as he said he didn't have many people to talk to and internet time was a precious commodity, so I felt guilty and sorry for him. About a month or so before I finally just stopped talking to him, he told me he was going to be stationed at Chicago so he could be closer to me, which gave me the chills because 1. Chicago was literally a 5-10 to 10 hour drive from where I live, and 2. I was going to Chicago for a school trip and I know I never mentioned it to him. I was so afraid of bumping into him, but also a little curious because I wanted to see the creep face to face. Yeah, by that time... I was well aware that he was a creep, but only because of how he split me and Rue up. Like I said, it never occurred to me how creepy he really was until a few days ago. Anyway, Rue and I are still best friends, and I honestly never heard from John again, not after he took a hint and realized I was ignoring him. Everyone here knows to be cautious, and to stress to their young loved ones to be cautious as well. I was trying to look this guy up to see if anything else has happened with him and other young girls, but it turned out the name he gave me was fake and related to his character, R.I.P. I'm not surprised since he lied so much about his age and because of what he was doing. It's no wonder his name was fake. Still freaks me out. I was in a toxic, borderline abusive, quote, friendship with a girl from the ages of around 9 to 12. Here's some background information to give you a little understanding as to what my life was like back in the late 2000s, early 10s. I grew up in a very tumultuous household. My parents hated each other and my extended family, along with my immediate, were plagued by mental illness and drug addiction. So needless to say, I was a very anxious child who was drawn to unstable people and suffice it to say, they were drawn to me. I was a shy 11-year-old girl who, like many others before me, used the internet as a way to vent my frustration and anger about my home life. This was the time where AOL was the main source of communication between friends and I was no stranger to this along with MySpace and Facebook. However, I wasn't like the typical preteen of this era, or so I thought. I kept my profiles private, never accepted a follow or a friend request that I didn't know, and never shared my location on these said profiles. This is the part where I introduce Tanya. Tanya isn't her real name, of course. She and I met in elementary school, one of the points in my life where my family situation was quite volatile, and in retrospect, 
I think she sensed this. I was vulnerable and Tanya took advantage of my innocence. She never really displayed any signs of her true intentions in the beginning, as they never usually do. She would do shady things every now and again, manipulate me into begging my mum to stay on the computer until the wee hours of the morning, so we could go on not safe for work websites, ghost me when I didn't give her my favourite pen, or yell at me when I couldn't perfect a guitar solo on Guitar Hero. She did some other things to me that I believe my brain blocked out due to trauma. My mum didn't like her either. Parents always have a weird intuition when it comes to friends, and I wish to God I would have listened to my mum before Tanya did what she did to me. Tanya's behaviour changed for the worst when we turned 11. Tanya was openly jealous of my success in school. Granted, she was incredibly smart herself, but she always made a point to mock me for having great grades and would always comment that since, quote, I wasn't pretty enough, having good grades would be a nice balance. Nice, right? It took me a while to build my self-esteem up after all the snide remarks she would make about my weight and my face, and only now, as a 22-year-old, do I think I'm that beautiful and have a wonderful figure. Anyway, back to Tanya. As a result of her jealousy and growing resentment towards me, she began to plot my downfall. I make no exaggeration either. This girl literally tried to ruin my self-worth, even more than she already had. It started in sixth grade. Tanya and I were remarkably close that year and I wanted to do everything with her. We would talk all day in school and we would chat all night on AIM. On one particular evening, Tanya and I were talking about boys being that we were hormonal preteens, our conversations would usually turn to who we liked in school that day. Being that I had a horrible relationship with my father, I didn't really trust boys, even from an early age, so it was rare if I developed a crush on one. I remember our conversation going a little something like this. Tanya, do you know Mark? Me, the kid in my class? Yeah, why? I heard he likes you. What? No way. Totally, he told me. You want me to talk to him and give him your username? Y yeah, of course. Oh my god, thank you, Tanya. My heart was racing. A boy liked me? Impossible. When Tanya told me that she would give Mark my username for AIM, I nearly exploded in my seat. Eleven-year-old me couldn't believe I was going to have my first real boyfriend. How wrong I was. Fast forward to the next night. I was getting ready for bed when I heard the famous AOL ding sound off my iPod touch. You know the sound I'm talking about. When I checked the notification, it was a message from MarkyBoy99. I don't remember his username, so we'll just go with something like this. I turned red. Tanya had really talked to Mark and gave him my user. She was truly the best. He messaged me with the usual, hey, emphasis on the three Ys at the end and I responded with hey, I didn't want to come off as desperate, so I only used one why. Not even a minute later, he messaged me back. We talked all night, about everything, our days, how school was, what type of silly bands we liked, typical 11-year-old stuff. I have to admit, I was smitten right off the bat. I think it was partly because I never really had a boy like me before, and the other part being that my self-esteem was so low that I never thought a boy would be capable of liking me. Also, it could have been because Mark was one of the most popular boys in school at the time. He played football, was mouthy to the teachers, and extremely outgoing. All the things a young girl would be attracted to. We talked for months, my puppy love growing for him more and more every time we chatted. Of course, I never spoke to him on the phone, nor did I get his phone number, because why would I do that, right? All the while I was speaking to him, Tanya would be gassing me up, telling me how proud she was of me, and that I deserved a boyfriend. My suspicions of Mark only began to grow when I attempted to approach him during school hours. Again, I had anxiety, so I would never really speak to Mark outside of AIM. When I went to talk to him, Mark looked confused, as if he had never had a conversation with me before in his life. He turned away from me on the playground and walked to be with his friends. Huh? Weird. This wasn't like him. 
He was usually so chatty with me online that I expected him to welcome me with open arms in person. My ego was bruised. My little 11-year-old mind tried to rationalize the behavior by chalking it up to him not wanting to speak to the nerd since he was so popular and that he preferred to keep our relationship online. I told Tanya the news and she seemed to be genuinely heartbroken for me. She was just as angry as I was and vowed to confront Mark later that day during music class. I was happy. Tanya had my back and as far as I knew, she was going to tell Mark off about him being a total jerk to me. Well, it worked. Later that night, I got a message from Mark telling me how sorry he was for ignoring me and that he was just going through some, quote, family things. Back in love, I was. I didn't care that Mark ignored me during school. I didn't care that he rejected my advances in person. As long as I had him to talk to online and Tanya's support, I was fine. I even told my mum about him and she was extremely happy for me as well. Another month passed and it was March 31st, 2011. Mark messaged me and told me he had something very important to tell me the next day. The anxiety began. What was it? What did he have to tell me? At that point, I considered myself and Mark to be dating, so I was anxious that he was either going to break it off with me or that he was going to make us public in school the next day. I told my mum and Tanya, almost on the verge of tears with how excited and nervous I was. Well, the next day, April 1st, 2011 rolled around, and this is what followed. It was around 7pm, and I was on Club Penguin, as I usually was, until I heard a familiar ding. It was Mark, and it was time for the news I'd been waiting for all day. It said, Hey babe, smiley face. OMG, hey, I've been waiting for you to chat to me all night. Sorry babe, I was at practice, frowny face. Are you ready for the news? I was shaking with anticipation at this point. Even writing this now, a whole swell of emotions are resurfacing. I said, Yes, of course. It was then that Mark sent me a picture. I opened it, but only it wasn't Mark. It was Tanya, and she was holding a handwritten sign that said, Happy April Fool's Day. At first, I started laughing, and I mean it was an ugly laugh. Of course it was a prank. Tanya had gotten me so good, right? Right? Well, wrong. It was then that the realization hit me that I started to sob. I felt betrayed and like a loser. Tanya had been behind Mark all along, catfishing me, and she had been planning this big joke since October of 2010. She had been so jealous that she pretended to be someone else and string along my emotions when she knew I was already in a rough place mentally. She told me that I was stupid to even think that Mark would even like me in the first place and that I was dumb for not asking for his number. Tanya had been at this for six months. An 11-year-old girl plotted Mark, used him to make me think a boy liked me, and tricked me into believing that I had a boyfriend, all the while telling me when we hung out that she was happy for me and that Mark and I were a cute couple. I told my mum, who then called her mum. My mum was livid to say the least. She told Tanya's mum to tell her daughter never to speak to me again. I was crushed. My best friend of three years had catfished me because she simply wanted to play a joke. I was loyal to her, and she toyed with my emotions because she could. Tanya had tried multiple times to guilt trip me into being her friend again in the months that followed leading into seventh grade. One of the more memorable and honestly messed up times being when she messaged me a few days after my birthday in August to tell me that her mother had just died in a horrible car crash. Her body was dismembered and they could only find her head and wedding ring. As anyone would be, I was in tears. Tanya's mother was nothing but lovely to me and learning that she died in such a violent way crushed my soul. I started talking to Tanya again, asking her when her mother's funeral would be. Tanya then revealed to me seconds later, after speaking to her about the grisly details over her mother's passing, that she was quote, kidding, and was pranking me again, and that I was stupid to believe her. She even sent a video of her laughing at me. I was disgusted. Who would even say something like that? 
what now 12 year old would message something like their mother was dismembered in a car crash? She then revealed her ugly and quite frankly evil intentions when we were in the beginning of seventh grade and she became friends with a girl named Kaylee. They both invited me to sit with them at their lunch table and because I was desperate for friends, I stupidly accepted only to be met with hordes of insults and laughter behind my back every chance I wasn't looking. Tanya then messaged me one night telling me to kill myself and that the world would be a much better place without me in it. She and Kaylee told me to go jump off a bridge. Tanya told me that she hated me and she was never really my friend to begin with and that I deserved all the pain she put me through the previous year. I again told my mum, who then called the police. She had had enough of Tanya and so had I. For four years I had put up with Tanya's malicious behaviour and I just couldn't handle it anymore. My mum made me delete my AIM account and Tanya's mum told her to never contact me again or else. My mum also advised me to move lunch tables but I was hell bent on not letting Tanya win. For the entirety of the seventh grade, I sat at the same table as Tanya, only I spoke to my friends at the other side of the table. I never spoke to her, looked at her, or gave her any sort of attention. Kaylee was scared to death of me afterwards too, as the police had gotten in contact with her family as well. It's been 10 years and I still haven't spoken to Tanya. I'm 22 years old, have two bachelor's degrees, one in psychology and the other in history, and I'm now working towards my master's in clinical social work. Tanya did other things to me too that I could write a whole other story about, but I think writing this one helped give me closure on the part of my childhood that scarred me for years. I thank God for my mum stepping in when she did, because I don't know where I'd be without her. As for Tanya, I don't know where she is or what she's doing, and I'd really rather not. On the off chance she stumbles upon this story, I have a message for her. Your jealousy and wishes for death upon me did not win, and I truly hope that karma does not come around one day and bite you in the ass. Tanya, let's never meet again.